good morning to you all. And uh, thank you so much for joining uh, this webinar today on the orientation, um, on the identification of priority areas for multi-sectorial um, interventions uh, for cholera control and elimination, uh, in short, the PAMIs. So today we, we are going to have um, this webinar and um, we, we have a, uh, uh, a schedule of uh, panelists that are going to orient us in the, um, in the, in the PAMIs identification for elimination of cholera and also for control. I hope you are able to hear us from wherever you are joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you, you are getting us from. I'm going to uh, take you through the housekeeping rules. And then from there, I will invite our uh, team lead for emergency preparedness in the Nairobi hub, uh, Dr. Miriam, to do the opening remarks. Before I start, I just want you to all note that um, this webinar training adheres to the code of conduct to prevent harassment, including sexual harassment at WHO events. So during the webinar, you are allowed to use the, the Q&A feature for questionings regarding the topic and presentation. Only questions in the Q&A will be answered during the sessions and then live questions will be taken at the end of the presentations. I want to emphasize that please use the Q&A feature on your uh, devices to give questions regarding the presentations and all the technical questions. And then you are allowed to use the chat feature for questions regarding IT or logistics. And um, these will be also answered in the, in the chat, please use the Q&A for technical questions and the uh, presenters will be uh, available at all times to answer these questions and only the live questions at the end of the, of the presentations. I also want to alert you that we do have live transcriptions. You can click on your devices that show, uh, uh, show captions and then you can also hide these captions at whatever time you feel like by clicking on hide captions. Again, I want to bring to your attention that um, the, um, by, by uh, registering, you will be given the recordings, the materials, and the feedback um, after the, the sessions. Uh, using the emails that you 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 registered with and this webinar is being you is being recorded um, and all the recordings and the materials will be shared and please uh use the 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 q and a uh, for technical questions questions like uh, if the materials will be will be shared uh, yes, the materials will be shared, and I will emphasize this even in the in the chat session, so that we we can use the Q and A for technical questions only. And your feedback is very very important, as this will uh, give us uh, 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 clues on how to improve on our trainings and also how to um, tailor your the the future trainings to the best need of, the, um, of you, the participants, and also just to look at the expectations of, the, of, of you, the participants. So please um, interact with us in the, in the feedback uh, session. So today we do have a, a packed program, but I hope we'll be able to finish within the stipulated time. Um, I just want to take this time to introduce uh, the panelists for today. I do have uh, Dr. Fred Kapaya, uh, is a technical officer in the Nairobi Hub, WHO Nairobi Hub. 
uh, with extensive uh, experience in uh, uh, cholera control, uh, both at uh, national, uh, regional, and uh, global level. He brings with him 18 years of progressive uh, experience and expertise uh, in cholera programs, um, in preparedness, readiness, and response. Um, and uh, he's a public health uh, specialist, and you'll be taking us through the, the sessions today in the, in the, um, in the identification of uh, priority areas for multi-sectorial interventions. I do also have uh, Dr. Anne Rolek. She's a medical uh, officer uh, who has helped uh, countries in identification of uh, PAMIs. She's currently working with uh, WHO headquarters and uh, also part of the GTFCC um, team, which is a global task force for cholera control. And uh, she's currently working on um, developing an online training for, for PAMI identification. Um, last but not the least, I do have uh, Morgan Rodriguez. Uh, is an epidemiologist at the WHO Korea program in Geneva since 2020. She has coordinated the activities of uh, epidemiology working of uh, the Global Task Force for Korea Control, including the strengthening of Korea surveillance and the identification of priority areas for multi-sectorial uh, interventions, which is the PAMIS. So we do have an extensive line today and uh, please feel free to put in all your uh, questions in the chat box and those that will have questions later after the presentations you can raise up your hand and then we can have a, a session of interaction so this is how our program will be um, at this moment uh, sorry about the, the slide at this moment i want to welcome um, dr dr miriam nanyunza to give us the opening remarks and then the objectives will be given by uh, Dr. Fred Kapaya. After that, we are going to go into the presentation on what the PAMIs are, which uh, Dr. Kapaya is going to take. And then I will invite Morgan and uh, to come and give uh, the GTFCC method for identification of PAMIs to develop the national control, uh, national uh, cholera control plan for elimination. And then I will talk. We will bring uh, Dr. Kapaya back to take us through. Uh, the GTFCC tool for identification of PAMIs, uh, which will be supported, she will be supported by uh, Anne Rolek, and then we'll have uh, a Q&A session after the, the presentations. Thank you so much, and let's welcome uh, Dr. Miriam Nanyunza to give us the opening remarks. Thank you so much, and over to you, Dr. Miriam. Okay, good morning, colleagues. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Uh, I hope you can hear me. Right. Yes, we can hear you, I would Dr. like Miriam. to welcome. Okay, I'd like to welcome you once again to this webinar on uh, orientation on the methodology for identification of priority areas for multi sectoral interventions, what we call PAMIS, uh, or simply what we used to call uh, the, the cholera hotspots. And uh, this webinar is the third in a series. We had the uh, uh, first one two weeks ago, and it was on uh, how to identify PAMIs for cholera control for Anglophone countries. We had the next one for Francophone countries. And this is the third one that we are having on how to identify cholera or hotspots or PAMIs for cholera elimination. The first two are, were addressing cholera control. So now this is to go forth and see how to identify the PAMIs for cholera elimination. It's intended really to equip national level experts with the knowledge and skills that they need to identify PAMIs uh, using a scientifically proven method. Uh, we all know that uh, since 2021, we have had an upsurge of cholera pandemic and uh, in Africa, we really had uh, a big number of cases associated with high mortality. And we saw the outbreak spread to new geographical areas that we thought were really free from cholera in the past. And we also noted that uh, several factors contributed to this big outbreak in 2021 to 2023. 
including climate change, water scarcity, political instability, and armed conflict, among others. But the gaps in WASH was really the, the key contributing factor uh, related to all these uh, other uh, background factors. And we all know that uh, the Global Cholera Roadmap launched by the Global Task Force for Cholera in 2027 has a goal of eliminating cholera in at least 20 countries by 2030. In Afro Africa region, we also adopted this framework and we developed a, a strategy for control of cholera by 2030, but I know that we can also eliminate cholera in some of our countries by 2030 if we put our effort to this. Now, the key strategic axis for implementation of this uh, global roadmap is identification of PAMIS. Really, this is the, the main starting point. If we identify the PAMIS, and we put all the targeted interventions uh, in these areas using a multi-sectoral approach, we can eliminate the, the, the cholera burden. And uh, starting with the permits at a time, we can eliminate this cholera from the, the region. As technical officers from your different countries, you are key to the implementation of this roadmap and you are key to the identification of these PAMIs. So that's why you have been invited to this webinar to really get to understand uh, the scientific method of how we can identify these PAMIs and uh, uh, consider it for your countries. And based on this, plan the multi-sectoral approach for, for cholera control. We know that in cholera control and elimination, sorry for cholera elimination, for cholera control and elimination, we have been working with partners, including UNICEF, MSF, IFRC, Africa CDC, uh, among others. And uh, we want to thank all these for the effort thus far in the fight against cholera. Uh, we also want to request or implore them to continue with us in this effort towards elimination of cholera in the different countries, and thus supporting the identification of PAMIS and the multi-sectoral approach in, in, in these PAMIS for the control and elimination of, of cholera. We want to thank you, the member states, for your continued commitment to this goal of control and elimination of cholera. As WHO, we'll continue to engage you, provide the technical support to ensure that there's better preparedness, but also uh, interventions are done towards the elimination of cholera in the region. And I know and affirm that together we shall eliminate cholera in our region, step by step, if we start by make uh, identification of this permits, which is a critical step in the beginning of all these uh, interventions. With that, I want to wish you a successful webinar. Pay attention, ask questions where you are, things are not clear, so that by the time we leave this webinar, we are all clear on how to identify these PAMIs and uh, be able to use them as starting point for elimination of cholera in our countries. Thank you all for your attention and best wishes for a successful webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miriam, um, for those uh, welcoming remarks, uh, really emphasizing the points on the, on the identification of uh, PAMIs and also just highlighting the, the, the challenges uh, that uh, the cholera outbreaks have been putting across in the, in the region. Thank you so much, ma'am, for, for the nice welcoming remarks. And at this point, I want to bring uh, Dr. Kapaya on the floor to give us the, um, the objectives of the, of the webinar. Over to you, Dr. Kapaya. Thank you very much, Dr. John, um, for, for this. So as said, I'm Fred Kapaya. I'm going to uh, take you through the objectives of this webinar.
So the general objective would like to orient and guide member states on the identification of priority areas for mouth sector interventions for cholera elimination. So I'm emphasizing this is cholera elimination. Our specific objectives would like to explain what PAMIs are, the types, and the importance of identifying these PAMIs. We also want to describe the process of PAMI identification. And we want to introduce the GTFCC tool for PAMI identification. Lastly, but not the least, we'd like to enlighten our member states about the support that is available for PAMI identification, including the resources and materials, the technical support, and how you can request for this support. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the objectives for our webinar today, and I urge you to pay particular attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kapaya. Um, I think the objectives have been laid up and um, at this time, I would want to bring back Dr. Kapaya on the floor to give us now the details of the presentations on what are PAMIs. Over to you again, Dr. Kapaya. So thank you again, Dr. Masina. So again, I'm Fred Kapaya. So let me just take you through um, an understanding of what these PAMIs mean what are they and why are they important and why should we talk about them? So PAMIs, just like uh, Dr. Miriam has uh, told us, simply stands for priority areas for mouth sectoral interventions. These are the same areas that we used to call cholera hotspots. So these are small areas where the cholera bedding is highly concentrated and outbreaks of cholera usually start in these small areas and then spread to other areas. So now, why is it that the term or the word was changed from hotspots to PAMIs? It's because of the realization that in order for us to eliminate cholera, we need the intervention of all the key sectors. So we need mouth sectoral partners coming together to work in these areas which we are saying they are priority for elimin elimination. So it's not only the baby of the Minister of Health, but it has to involve all the others, including Ministry responsible for water and sanitation, environment, Minister of Agriculture, community development. All these are actually very important. And that's why it was thought that instead of calling it hotspots, we change the term to PAMIs to reflect what exactly this is. That is priority areas for mouth sectoral interventions. Now I want to actually explain something that again, Dr. Miriam, Miriam talked about. So the global roadmap that was launched in 2017 to end the cholera by 2030 calls for both control and elimination strategies. Now, these strategies are targeted at these hotspots or PAMIs, which we call the priority areas. So the question that you may ask is, so what is the purpose of identifying these PAMIs? So number one, identification of PAMIs is a very important step. It helps to make decisions for targeted interventions that are actually effective. It tends to guide the geographic targeting of these interventions so you will know the areas where the problems are instead of actually shooting all over. So you will target your interventions. It is also a very important step when you are developing a national cholera plan, which is a strategic, strategic document that provides direction towards elimination. Now, we are saying that the identification of these PAMIs is actually key for us to be able to control or 
eliminate cholera. You will be able to understand this more as we move on. So the question would be how long does this one um, identification of families take? Ideally, this takes a maximum of six months, but this can be shortened, I will explain. The reason why we want to have enough time is that we need to properly identify these areas, use data that is accurate and that is of good quality. So that once you identify them, you will not be able to make any mistakes. You'll be so sure these are the areas that are identified. So these six months is broken down as follows. In the first month, you're supposed to have what is referred to as an inception of PAMI identification. So this is where we take you through what this PAMI identification is. You appreciate, you understand with all the mouth sectoral partners. During this process, we also want to form a core team that will be responsible for actually um, identifying these families. Then the second step is even more critical, which is the data collection. And this is where you need to spend a, a bit of time because you need to collect very good quality data. This may take up to two months. So in the third and in the second and third month, you actually be dealing with data collection and filling of the GTFCC Excel tool. You make you be very clear as we move on in the subsequent presentations. So we want you to take a bit of time to collect data. Now, once you have collected data, the next uh, stages are very easy and you can easily move very fast. So we are saying in the fourth month, you may need to have a stakeholder validation workshop where you bring all the stakeholders that are relevant to cholera elimination. And then we look at the data and then the data is validated and you agree, you build consensus, you agree that these are the areas that all of us agree, have agreed and this is where we're going to target our intervention so that even during their planning in their respective ministerial action plans, they can actually put into consideration those areas that have been identified. In the fourth month, in the fifth month, we encourage countries to document, that is to write the report for the PAMI identification. And then you can now request that your report can be reviewed by the GT, GTFCC PAM, PAMI review uh, committee, just to validate and just to look at how you did your work and ensure that it actually complies with the GTFCC method. But this period of six months can be shortened, especially if you are so dedicated and you can collect data. Uh, for example, you don't need to have an inception, uh, inception of PAMI identification for the whole month. If you are so uh, committed, you can actually reduce this period. The number of countries that have done, have done in less than six months, um, some in two months, they've been able to do this, some in three months. So uh, this is some something that we need to look at when we are considering identification of these families. Now, the question again is, why should countries use the GTFCC method uh, to identify the families? Number one, this is a globally accepted method for everyone to use, and all the other countries are using the same. And it is a prerequisite for countries to move forward with cholera control and elimination, especially that we have the, uh, the ending cholera global, uh, a global roadmap to 2030, which all the countries have agreed, all the countries endorsed. And therefore, we need to use this method to guide us moving forward. Now, one of the things that again comes is to is the question of why should we have two methods? for PAMI identification. So the first thing that we need to understand is that there are countries where the cholera burden is high or moderate. Now, because the cholera transmission is high to moderate, these countries should first of all control before they think of eliminating. So we are encouraging countries that have high to moderate cholera transmission to first of all control cholera. Examples. We include Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, Kenya, 
uh, Ethiopia, these countries should first of all concentrate on controlling before they move on to elimination. And then countries that have law to new cholera transmission, these countries now should move to elimination. Why should they move to elimination? They need to identify those vulnerability factors that may reintroduce cholera in their environment. So they need to actually ensure that they put in measures to eliminate the vulnerabilities. And by eliminating the vulnerabilities, then they can eliminate cholera. And we are going to see as we, we move on when we talk about the vulnerability factors in the subsequent presentations. So you'll be able to ask, especially countries that have never seen cholera, why then should you be able to identify these families because you've never had cholera in your countries or cholera is very low in your countries? The reason is that as long as there are factors, vulnerability factors exist in your country, then there is a possibility or the country is at risk for cholera re-emergence, cholera re-occurrence, cholera introduction in your country. Good examples, countries that are surrounded by countries that have high incidence of cholera, high transmission of cholera, countries that we can say are endemic to cholera, Though you've never experienced as a country a, a cholera outbreak as a country, but you have neighbors that have cholera, there is a chance, there is a risk that cholera can be introduced in your country. So before it is introduced in your country, you need to identify the factors that can introduce cholera in your country. And these are what we call vulnerability factors. And we are saying that to eliminate cholera sustainably, countries with low to new cholera transmission should maintain their efforts to prevent the re-emergence of cholera outbreaks by mitigating cholera vulnerabilities in the PAMIs through implementation of a national cholera plan for elimination. So it is very, very important. Now, when it comes to the identification of PAMIs, we are so lucky, all of us, that there are materials available and support available for us to use. So GTFCC has come up with the guidance document that describes the method for PAMI identification for cholera elimination. This guidance document is available in Arabic, English, French, and Portuguese. Added to, to this, there is an Excel tool. You will be able to see this as we do, we continue the presentation. There's an Excel tool that automates all the calculations for PAMI identification. So it will do the work for you as long as you have properly collected the data and you have inputted into the tool, you'll be able to see this. And the third uh, uh, supporting material is the user guide. So there is a user guide that will give you a step-by-step -step instructions for preparing data. And in this, you also have what we call the training data set. This is available for you to use as you to familiarize yourself with the tool, very important. And then you have a data template that you can use for you to be able to enter data at the country level. Okay, lastly, but not the least, we talk about the GTFCC PAMI reviews. So, when you are identifying the PAMIs, it is very important after you finish the identification and you do the report that you can submit to the GTFC PAMI review or the GTFCC to review how you were able to do your PAMIs. This is very important because then your plan or your PAMIs will be endorsed, validated, and you'll be, you, 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 you will qualify to move to the next level, that is to start intervention planning, including development of the national cholera plan. So which country should request a review? So it's any country that had identified its PAMIs can you request for a PAMI uh, review. So if you have identified your PAMIs, you can request. When should you request for a review? So immediately after you finish uh, identifying your PAMIs, and you have done your report, you can request for a review 
And where do you request for a review or how do you request for a review? So we are saying national authorities can request it through the GTFCC secretariat, that is the email, and you attach the following. So you attach the PAMI identification report, and then also the completed GTFCC PAMI Excel tool and map of the PAMIs. All this will become clearer as we do uh, the presentation today. I also want to indicate here that uh, we have what we call a GTFCC PAMI coordination uh, group or committee. And from our side as WHO, myself and Dr. Vincent represent WHO on this committee. And then we also have a lot of other partners, including the Africa CDC, including UNICEF, IFRC, and we have a lot of colleagues. So at the time when you want to start identification of PAMIs, please reach out to us and we'll be able to offer the necessary support. You can reach out to us as WHO and we are on hand. You can also reach out to other colleagues because we are a, we are a team and we're working together on this uh, PAMI identification. So uh, in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, this is what PAMIs are, and you'll be able to get more and more information as we go on with our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kapaya, for that presentation. And um, as we move on into the presentations, I just want to remind you that you, you can put your technical questions in the Q&A and any, any IT support in the, in the, in the chat uh, box. At this time, let me have a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Morgan Rodriguez to come to give us the GTFCC method for identification of PAMIs to develop uh, a national cholera plan for cholera elimination. Thanks, and uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Dominguez. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. So in this presentation, I will uh, provide an overview of this GTFCC method to identify PAMIs for elimination. So in the previous presentation, um, Dr. Kapaya very clearly outlined what are the PAMI, and he also mentioned that there are those two different GTFCC PAMI methods. One to identify PAMIs for cholera control, which was the focus of the previous webinars. And the other method is to identify PAMIs for cholera elimination, which is truly our focus for our, for our session today. So in this presentation, I will cover in more uh, practical terms which countries should use this method PAMIs for elimination. And I will also outline the, the key principle of the actual methods to identify PAMIs for elimination. So this identification of the PAMIs, as Dr. Kapaya emphasized, is one of the first steps for a country to develop a national cholera plan, a NCP. And usually, those NCPs would have an implementation period of roughly uh, five years. So considering this time frame of five years of intervention, a NCP for elimination, and therefore PAMIs for elimination, are primarily for countries that can realistically achieve cholera elimination over roughly a five-year period. And for other countries, those, those are still uh, highly affected by cholera. Instead, uh, the recommendation is to first aim for cholera control. And then when the cholera situation will, I, will have improved in those countries, elimination may become the next uh, objective to, to target and, and to be achieved. But overall, it's a progressive and iterative uh, pathway. So when do we consider that uh, realistically elimination can be achieved in the next uh, five years and therefore the, the method PANIS for elimination can and, and should be used? If in a country over the past five years, 
less than 5% of the geographic unit uh, of the country reported cholera outbreaks, then we consider that this country is ready to target elimination and should identify the permits for elimination. On the other end, uh, countries where more than 5% of the geographic unit reported cholera outbreaks in the past five years are encouraged to aim for cholera control, at least as an intermediate objective, and to identify the permits for cholera control. So having in mind which country should identify permits for elimination, now we will see how to actually identify permits for elimination. Overall, there are two main phases in this, uh, in this process. The first phase will be to prepare for an evidence-based decision-making. And for that, all of the geographic units of a country will be scored according to a numeric index that we call the vulnerability index. And this index basically captures the vulnerability to cholera. That's the first phase, preparing for decision making. And now the second phase will be for the different stakeholders of a country to use this numeric index to actually make a decision on the list of PAMI. And this will be done by setting a threshold for this index. And all of the units that will have an index above this threshold will be PAMIs. So overall in a country, those, those areas that are permits for elimination will be any geographic unit where there has been cholera outbreak in the past five years. But the thing is, if a country does meet the criteria for using this method permit for elimination, then there will be very, very few units that will be PAMI based on this criteria of recent occurrence of cholera outbreak. So in addition, all units that are considered highly vulnerable to cholera because they have an index above a threshold will also be PAMIs. And all other units which either did not have cholera outbreaks in recent years or are not considered highly vulnerable to cholera based on their vulnerability index will not be PAMIs will not be priority areas for these countries to eliminate cholera. So this index plays really a critical role in the decision making on PAMIs. And uh, we will see how it is calculated. Basically, this index results from an assessment of vulnerability factors that may be associated with the reemergence of cholera. And those might be any factors that could increase the risk of introduction of cholera in a unit, or after introduction, onset of an outbreak within this unit, or spread of the outbreak from this unit to other units. And in order to, to help and assist countries in identifying those vulnerability factors, the, GTS, the GTSCC has developed uh, an indicative list of vulnerability factors. In this list, we have all factors that are expected to be relevant in most countries, in most contexts. But uh, countries may also wish to, further to that, to add also some factors that are not in this list, but they, that they consider especially important and relevant in their country-specific context. So that's why this GTFCC list is only indicative. It can be adapted by countries, and countries may add some other factors relevant in their context. Uh, to, this, to this initial list that is provided uh, in an indicative manner. So on the slide, those different vulnerability factors uh, are listed. They are not listed by priority uh, order. We consider that all of them may play in most countries uh, a role in potential cholera reemergence. 
So the first one would be the occurrence of imported cholera cases in recent years. When I was showing the diagram, I show that any area that had cholera outbreaks in recent years would be a PAMI, regardless of its vulnerability index. But if there has been imported cholera cases without secondary cases, this will not qualify as a cholera outbreak, it's just an imported case. But it shows that there is a risk for introduction of cholera in this area because it has actually happened in recent years. So first factor, imported cholera cases. Then cross-border areas, which are located along uh, areas in neighboring countries, which are either currently affected by cholera outbreak or identified as PAMI in these neighboring countries. Then we have in the unit the presence of uh, major travel routes and transportation up. And we invite you to consider this one because it might play a role uh, for cholera introduction, but also should there be a cholera outbreak also for spread from this unit to other units. Then we have major population gathering, basically for the same reasons as the previous one. Next come high population density. Uh, and this might be a risk factor for outbreaks spreading uh, very rapidly upon introduction. High risk population. So high risk population basically would be populations that may have an increased risk of exposure to cholera. To give an example, uh, this might be, for instance, uh, fishermen communities that may have a greater risk of exposure to cholera. Moving to the right column, we have hard, hard to access population. And this one uh, is to be considered because uh, in very remote areas that are hard to access, hard to access, there might be delay possibly in detecting the outbreak, but also in uh, implementing a rapid response to the outbreak. And as a result, uh, it might be a vulnerability for spread. OCV uh, in recent years and especially if OCV was not combined with wash improvement. Uh, if there has been OCV in recent years, then it could be that there has been no outbreak because there was this vaccinal immunity. But if in parallel, there was no real strong wash improvement, this area remain just as vulnerable to cholera as it was before OCV. OCV is only a temporary solution. Then we have uh, areas that might be of greater risk for a climatic uh, event. Next is areas that are affected with humanitarian emerger em emergencies. And last, but definitely extremely important to consider, would be areas with poor wash, so insufficient access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. Again, this indicative list captures factors that we think might be relevant in most countries, but we do invite you to analyze the transmission pattern in previous outbreaks in your country to possibly add some other factors to consider when assessing the vulnerability of an area for uh, the re-emergence of cholera outbreaks. So after a country has decided on which vulnerability factors will be considered in the analysis, because they are relevant for this country, then the stakeholders of the countries would have to determine how they will measure the presence or the absence of each factor in each unit. And this will be achieved by defining a measurable vulnerability indicator for each vulnerability factor. For example, one vulnerability factor, we've seen it in the previous slide, might be areas which have a high population density. That would be a vulnerability factor. But having said that, what does it mean, high population density, in a quantitative and in a measurable manner? So this will have to be defined by each country taking into account its specific uh, context. And then the country will be able to determine that above this value of density, for my country, this is high density, 
And this will be the measurable vulnerability indicator associated with the vulnerability factor. And the list of vulnerability factors and associated vulnerability indicators is fully consolidated. Then the presence or the absence of each vulnerability is assessed for each geographic unit of the country. And the presence is scored as one point if a vulnerability is present, and as zero point if the vulnerability is absent in, in the unit that is uh, considered. After this scoring, uh, the vulnerability index is pretty simple to calculate. It's just the sum of the score of each factors and indicators for each unit. It's really just a sum. It's pretty straightforward. As a general principle, there will be no weighting in this uh, sum. So all factors would have the same weight in the sum, except if a country has a, a strong justification, a strong reason to believe that more weight should be given to a factor, then the country may do so and would be encouraged, encouraged to justify and to document why this weight was given. This vulnerability index, again, is calculated for each uh, geographic unit of the country. And uh, this would then conclude phase one of the process, which was about preparing for the decision making and planning. The next phase will then about making an actual decision on the list of families using this numeric index to inform the decision making process. And this decision should be made by consensus between multiple stakeholders of the country that ideally would represent uh, different sectors, uh, the health sector, importantly, the wash fact sector as well, uh, finance, etc. And it would be best to bring all of the stakeholders together, preferably in, in a workshop format, so they can really be together and discuss and decide on this result of the vulnerability index. And again, this result is important because all of the geographic units that have an index value above the result that will be decided by the stakeholders of the countries will be permitted. To, to decide on this result and set the, the relevant result value for the countries, the stakeholder will have to balance two, two dimensions. One would be the feasibility of the future NCP, and the other one would be the potential impact of the future NCP. So this is the principle for decision making. And in the next presentation, uh, you will see more, more practical illustration of this decision making and how to balance different dimensions for a country to decide on the most relevant reason in its context. So at the end of this family workshop, basically, stakeholders of the countries will have agreed by consensus on the, their list of families. And now we will focus on what the country will do uh, next, as really immediate next step after this workshop. The first thing that should be done uh, rapidly after the, the PAMI workshop would be to document the process in a PAMI identification report. And this report should in particular document all decisions that were made and also the, the justification for all of the decisions that were made. This documentation of the process is, is important for traceability of the decision making. And to help you prepare a comprehensive report, we invite you to follow the, the template that is provided by the GTFCC. When this PAMI report will be ready and validated at national level, then as Dr. Kapaya uh, emphasized, country would be encouraged to request a GTFCC PAMI review. Those reviews are independent technical reviews, which are performed by international experts of the GTFCC. And it is best for countries to request these review before they actually start using the list of PAMIs to plan intervention, because that way 
it would be easier for countries to actually take the feedback into account before starting uh, going moving forward with, with their intervention plan. To request a review, you can either contact me directly or contact the GTFCC Secretariat. And uh, in terms of, of planning, um, you, you can expect to receive the, the, the outcome of the review within 30 days. So this was a, a quick overview of the GTFCC method to identify families for elimination. And uh, we do have lots of supporting material available for you online. So using the link that is in the upper corner of, of the slide, but you can also find it in, a, in an answer to a Q&A on Zoom, you will find uh, what we call the GTFCC PAMI Starter Pack. In this starter pack, you will have a FAQ on PAMIs. And in this FAQ, we have compiled all questions that we very frequently receive from countries on, on PAMIs. So uh, if you have questions on PAMI, we do encourage you to, to look at this FAQ. Uh, it's likely that you will find an answer to your question. Also, we have a one pager uh, to, to remind you the key principle of PAMI identification. Uh, and, and remind you of, of the criteria regarding which, mission, which method uh, would be most appropriate in your country, depending on the cholera situation in your country. A one pager as well to remind you of the key principle to identify PAMIs for elimination. And lastly, uh, one pager uh, where you will find more practical intervention regarding why PAMI reviews are actually beneficial for countries and also how to request a PAMI review. And those are like summary short resources, but we also have detailed technical uh, resources. Uh, again, you can access those either using the link on the slide or also looking at the Q&A. So for PAMI for elimination, uh, you will find a detailed technical guidance document going through all of the details of the method, an Excel tool uh, which automatizes all calculations and which will be introduced uh, in the next presentation, a template to format your data, a training data set to try to play with the tool and, and get familiar with, with the use of the tool, a user guide for the tool, and uh, lastly, a template for your PAMI report. So overall, I think we can say that there is a pretty solid and comprehensive package of resources for you available online. But as uh, Dr. Kapaya emphasized, should you need any additional guidance, the GTFCC and the network of the GTFCC partners are available to, to support you, to guide you in the process. So don't hesitate to reach out to us for any question, for any guidance, and also please inform us when your country is engaged uh, in PAMI identification and keep us updated as you, as you progress in the process. So to conclude, what to, to remember about PAMI for elimination? First, an important point to remember would be that this is for countries where cholera was reported in less than 5% of the geographical units over the past five years. And other countries should instead identify PAMIs for control. The, the, the PAMIs for elimination in a country will be all units where cholera outbreaks were reported in the last five years. And in addition, geographic units that are considered highly vulnerable to the reemergence of cholera outbreak as assessed and captured by their vulnerability index will also be PAMIs for elimination. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I think in the next presentation, Anne will actually go into more practical detail. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dominguez. And uh, uh, thank you also for keeping uh, the time really well. Uh, at, uh, I think now, um, we are happy and uh, I think the participants are happy that we understand what the PAMIs are. We, we know what the vulnerability index is. 
And I think we do have now an agreement on the vulnerability threshold value. Um, and, and, and now we want to use this information to see how best we can put them packaged together and uh, see how we can go through the GTFCC2 for identification uh, uh, of, of, of PAMIs. And I want to welcome back uh, Dr. Kapaya to be supported by uh, uh, Dr. Anne Rolek as they take us through the GTFCC2 and see how best now we can put the information together. Thanks and uh, over to you, Dr. Kapaya. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masina. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, for a very good presentation. So now we move on to actually share how to use the GTFCC method for identification PAMIs for cholera elimination. Now I must indicate here that we'll try to be a bit slow so that you can understand how this tool works. And I must also emphasize that uh, most of the work, once you have collected data, once you input in the tool, everything that uh, Morgan was talking about will be done for you by the Excel tool. That is the beauty about this tool. We can go to the next, Dr. Ann. Okay. So now I really want everyone to understand. So there are the steps that we take to identify PAMIs for cholera elimination are as follows. So number one is to prepare the data sets. When you prepare the data sets, the, sec the next step is to upload the data in the GTFCC Excel tool, and then you review the calculations. You're going to see this. After you do this, then you are going to prepare for a stakeholder validation meeting where you are going to bring on board all key sectors, just like uh, Morgan said. You know, the Minister of, of Health itself, the ministry responsible for water sanitation, the Minister of Finance, uh, community um, um, ministry responsible for community, all these stakeholders, you bring them together in this stakeholder validation meeting. Now, it is very important because at this point, you want to build consensus, you want to validate, you want to agree as a country that this is actually what we have decided and this is the direction for all of us to move. Next. The key points to remember. Now, the vulnerability factors that um, uh, Morgan talked about. So here, you may be able to use the indicative list of vulnerability factors that GTFCC has done for us. But there are certain vulnerability factors that may be country specific. So they may not have been captured in the indicative list. So you also need to look at those vulnerability factors that are specific to your country, document them and include them. You will see in the tool that we use, the Excel tool for inputting data. Now, the data collection process, we are saying take the best of the data. So the most important is that you need to use good data, good quality data, and the most recent. You also need to discuss the biases. And each decision that you make, you need to document it. We'll be able to show this. And then this is supposed to be a participative process. It's not supposed to be one man show. It's not supposed to be one ministry. It's supposed to be everyone involved. So you need to organize early meetings to agree on parameters, vulnerability factors, and thresholds. I'll show some of the things that we need to do uh, to ensure that right from the beginning, we have participation from everyone. Next. Now, the tools that we need, and we have there the link that we can use. I already talked about this. So we have these tools. Number one, we have the user guide. So this is the one that will be giving you a step-by-step -step guide on the use of the Excel tool. Then you also have the Excel tool and you have the data template file. So there is a template, an Excel template that you can use to input your data as a country. And then we also have a training data set. Now, this is just a data set that you can use to try and train 
the, the data is already filled, so you can import into the tool, you see how it is coming out and how it, it is interpreted. Like I said, this is available in English, Arabic, French, and Portuguese. Next. So let's come to preparation of the data set. So here, you want to define the scope of the analysis. So the time and place. I want to really emphasize this. So uh, Morgan was talking about an NCP geographic unit. And in brackets, it was indicated admin level two or level three. Just to make it very clear, when we, when we say NCP geographic unit, this is the level of analysis, at a, a, a geographic level of analysis. Now, this geographic level of analysis can be a di at a district. That district becomes an NCP geographic unit, depending on the country. Or you can go down the district, you can go to the sub-district. Some countries have, have used, for example, words. Other countries have used even health facilities, depending on how the health system is arranged, and also depending on how the data is managed. Do you think you are going to have good quality data at district level or at subnational level? So you now pick that as a place of analysis, an NCP geographic unit. So you actually analyze. So now in the GTFCC2, the Excel2, let's assume you pick the counties or the districts as it were. I'll give an example of say uh, Kenya. So you will list all the 48 counties and then you will start inputting data on vulnerabilities for each county, you will see when the Excel sheet is shown. So if, if, for example, you say Nairobi County, you want now to discuss Nairobi County in terms of the vulnerability factors. So you ask, what is the wash situation in Nairobi? Okay, the next, you will talk about tra major transportation hubs. Is it a major transportation hub? Is it a yes or no? Just like Morgan said. So if it is a yes, it will have a score of one. If it is a no, it will have a score of zero. So you will score all the, the NCP geographic units, if it's the counts, until all the 48 have been scored. And then all the vulnerabilities that you have decided on as a country have also been considered and uh, and scored accordingly and put in the Excel tool. The next thing that I wanted to emphasize is the time. So the time period usually should range between five and 15 years, not less than five, not more than 15 years. If you can collect good enough data for five years or for six years or for 10 years, you can, you can do that. Now, this is retrospective data. So you may consider the period, like now, if we are in 2024, you may say, let's consider the period from 2023 going backwards for five years. Say we start in 2019 or 2018 up to 2023, and then look at these uh, NCP geographic units, look at these counties, what kind of vulnerabilities were there, including what Morgan talked about in terms of whether it recorded a cholera outbreak or not. Then you compile the population and the epidemiological data. Now the population, the, the, the population you are just going to consider the population of the last year of analysis. So if you are you are you 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 are considering the period 2018 to 2023, you you will get the population for 2023 and put there. You'll see Anne is going to emphasize that when she actually shows the two. And then the epidemiological data here, it's the outbreak. Did we have any confirmed outbreak in any one of the areas? So here the emphasis is that as long as any one area recorded a confirmed cholera outbreak, that once it, it is confirmed, that area is already a panic. That is one thing that we need to know because for it to actually have a cholera outbreak confirmed, it means that it has serious vulnerabilities that has resulted in the introduction of cholera in that area. The other one is the imported cases. 
And that is what uh, Dr. Morgan was talking about. So you select the vulnerability factors and define the, uh, the measurable vulnerability indicators. Then you compile the data to assess presence or absence of vulnerabilities, what I've been talking about, and then you prepare the data for the upload in the GTFCC tool. Next. So we come to the definition of the scope of analysis. So analysis period, we are saying epidemiological data, we are talking about five years, for example, going backwards. And then for vulnerability factors, we look at the most recent data that we have. So this is why, especially for elimination, we really need to bring on board people that have information from the other sectors as well. Then when we talk about geographic units, this is what I was explaining, at which level. So we are talking about interventions proposed in the NCP. Is it at district? Is it at sub-district? Then the population sizes should be adequate and the best epi data. And then you look at the best vulnerability factors data. And here we are saying administ administrative level two or three. So level two may be a district, level three sub-district. And here we use the GIS file. And colleagues that have, are, are actually very good in GIS are also very important to be part of this process. Next. Then compiling the surveillance data. So we come to the uh, population data. So we are saying estimated population at the last year of the analysis period, like I indicated. Then epidemiological indicators, I've already talked about this. So the occurrence of confirmed cholera outbreaks. I, we are saying at least one confirmed cholera case and lo locally acquired. So there's local transmission. So once the cholera is confirmed, that space or that district or that county or that sub-county is already a PAMI for cholera elimination. Then you also look at number of cholera cases imported from other countries or other units in the country. The fact that there was an importation, it means that there's a vulnerability. Maybe it's cross-border. And so it has come into the country, meaning that already that is a vulnerability that needs to be considered. And this is supposed to be done per geographic unit. So you may have to list all the units you, you, it's not even you may, you have to list all the units in the country and then you are going to uh, score them accordingly. Next. So now the select, selecting of vulnerability indicators. So there are two steps. The first step is that you are going to do a selection of vulnerability indicators by looking at the indicative list, the list that has come from the GTFCC, which is provided for you. And then you are also going to look at the additional country-specific vulnerability indicators. So you are not just going to be using what has been provided by GTFCC, just in case in your country, you also have country-specific vulnerability factors. You may need to look at that. Like I said, this is a participative process to select the vulnerability factors relevant in the country. And then the measurable indi indicator should be defined for each selected vulnerability factor, what, uh, what Morgan talked about. So the weighting has been given one and zero. If there is absence, it is zero. If there is presence, it is one. But as a country, depending on what you think uh, on the vulnerabilities that you have, you may decide to say, okay, maybe we are going to give a different weight to this, but you should be able to provide justification. We proceed. Okay, so let's come to the same uh, defining the uh, measurable vulnerability indicator. So for example, when we talk about high population density uh, locations or overcrowded settings, so the measurable vulnerability indicator, you are, talk you are looking at areas with high population density overcrowded settings where you have more than a thousand per square uh, kilometer. Now, where do you get this data? So the data source you can get from the Statistics Bureau, you can get from Ministry of Health. And you may be able now to indicate the, the year when the data was collected. So you can say 2023. And then you go to high-risk populations. So there, again, we are saying presence of high-risk groups, like Morgan said, presence of fishermen, mining population, pastoralists, nomads, refugees, displaced populations. Again, there you look at literature review, 
UNHCR data, it can be in the year 2024 data. Then you come to the unimproved water sources. We're saying areas with more than 30% of the population with access to unimproved water facility type or more than 15% of the population using surface water. Again, you can go to the GMP, maybe 2022, you put the year. So this is how you are going to be looking at each uh, vulnerability indicator. We proceed. Then after that, you'll be able to compile uh, the data for vulnerability factors. So here, identification of the suitable data sources. So we are saying select the most reliable and comprehensive data source with the highest data coverage. If needed, we are saying consider also proxy indicators, including at upper geographical levels, okay? Also ad hoc surveys to collect necessary data, expert knowledge for a qualitative assessment. So you may need to bring on board all these. You may need to consider all these. I think if not, this is the last slide that I'm presenting. I think the next is supposed to be Anne. So I'm handing over to Dr. Anne to take us through the two. Dr. Anne, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. So yes, so now you have seen how to collect all the different data that are needed to uh, be imported in the tool. The tool will really facilitate all the calculation. So you will have, co sorry, you have uh, gathered the population data, the cases data, uh, local and imported. Also, all the vulnerability factors with the vulnerability indicators. And these different uh, information, you have them per unit. And we, we, we stress the fact that it's important to, to give a unique identifier to each unit. It will help you in the different uh, step for the tool. So here we can see a, um, a screenshot of the template that we will use to import the data in the tool. So each column is a variable, so we saw them already, and each row represents one geographic unit. What we really recommend is to use the data model template that is available online with the, on the GTFCC website. The list should contain all the administrative units in the country, even if there is no cholera cases uh, that were reported in the last uh, five years or over the analysis period, or if even if uh, the unit uh, is not vulnerable for any uh, vulnerability factors. It's very important also to respect the order and the name of the variables, because it's like this that the tool will be able to calculate uh, all, the, all the different uh, uh, vulnerability uh, index. And in the user guideline, you will find a list of checks that we really stress are important to be sure that really the data are, uh, are well imported and represent the reality. There are also some advice about how to consider the missing data. So there are three steps to, to use the tool and to calculate the vulnerability index. First, to upload the data. Secondly, to manage the variability index calculation settings, we will be, uh, see uh, this uh, in the coming slide. And then after to check and to understand the vulnerability index that will be automatically calculated. So I will just switch to the presentation to, uh, to show you directly the tool. So here you can see the template that has been, that is empty without any data. It's what you can use to gather all your information. And you have a training data set that is available and that I will use for this presentation. 
So as we saw uh, before, here are the units. Here is the population, the last population um, estimate. Here, coded as yes, no, it's the variable where there are cholera uh, cases recorded in the, over the analysis period. And then after you have the different vulnerability factors that have been coded no as absence of vulnerability factor for this specific unit, or yes, if the vulnerability factor is present uh, for this unit. You have also the possibility to put missing value if the, missing, the information is missing for this administrative unit. So this is a, um, is a data template. And to import it in the tool, we will select the different columns and the different rows, not the entire um, uh, sheet. We will select it and we will copy the value in the tool. So in the tool, you can open it and you will have first information about the tool with specific links. And then after in yellow, so yellow are the sheet that where you can input data. The green is where you don't touch. It's only formula to, that have been uh, already uh, uh, prepared. So in the data input table, you can click on the sheet and copy only the value of your, uh, of your data template. So here you can see, and you can see that all my data have been imported in the tool. Then after we can review the different uh, uh, vulnerability factors. Just to, to recap, sorry. So we copy the data. What we also uh, recommend is to change the name of the file to each time use a new file. Like this, we are sure that the format and the formula have not been changed uh, by error. So the next step will be to check the list of vulnerability factors to update the definition if needed but we should not change the variable name to set the weight and also to ensure that which vulnerability factors will be included in the vulnerability index. So if we look at, sorry, at the tool itself, here you have this step where you have the vulnerability factors, the definition that you can adapt if uh, it was decided, uh, uh, for example, uh, the threshold of uh, population density, what you should not change is the variable name. And then on the other columns, you can apply a specific weight for this vulnerability factor if you think that uh, it's very important for the transition. But otherwise, we will keep uh, the weight of one for all the vulnerability factors to be considered equally. And here you, you select if you consider that this vulnerability factor should be included in the calculation of the, of the vulnerability index. So here we can, for example, we will have all of them included. This is a list that is proposed by the GTFCC. But you can see at the end of the list, you have four vulnerability factors that could be added and that are uh, country specific. Then after we will calculate the tool, will calculate for us the vulnerability index. On the tool itself, you can see that for the moment we have only the first row. And so you need to select it and to expand the selection to the exact number of row of your data set. For example, in the data training data set, we have 100 units. So we will select 
101. Here I select 102. You see that the last row is not filled. So I should really select only 101 as we have 100, 100 units. And so on this sheet, you can see the different calculation. First, you will have, again, the administrative unit, the population, the vulnerability factors. And at the end, the tool will calculate automatically the number of indicators that, are, uh, that is missing for each unit. And it will calculate the priority index. So for example, for a unit that had cholera cases registered the, over the analysis period, it will be automatically registered as initial PAMIs. And for the other one, in fact, it will count the sum of the vulnerability factors. So, so for example, for this one, there is no vulnerability factors that are uh, for uh, this uh, unit. And so the priority index will be zero. For another one, this one, we have one missing unit and we have only one yes as limited access to hygiene. And so we will get one missing value in this column and a priority, priority index at one. So what is important is to expand the selection, to review the calculated vulnerability index, and also to review the missing data. So as I already presented, the unit with at least one cholera cases, uh, one cholera case uh, registered over the period of, of uh, analysis will be uh, initial PAMI. If there is no uh, vulnerability factors present, the index value will be zero. And if we have one or more vulnerability uh, factors present, it will be the sum of the different uh, uh, vulnerability indicators. Sorry, I will just present. So I hope that it is clear. After you will have several uh, uh, tables that will summarize the different calculation. If it doesn't appear like, for example, here, you have to, um, sorry, to refresh all the table. Pivot table, and so it need to be refreshed to for uh, the tool to calculate all the different uh, tables. So here, for example, in our training data set, we can see that we have 20 units that have an initial PAMI that were uh, considered as initial PAMI because they had cholera cases during the studied uh, uh, period. And then after, for each vulnerability index, you have the number of units uh, and the number of population in each unit. You have also the relative percentage or the cumulative percentage for the unit and for the population. You have another a sheet that is a, a review of all the missing data. So to be able to interpret correctly the results. And at the end, you have an export that summarize all the information with the information that you, uh, you collected and with the calculation. So the missing and the priority index, and it's automatically rank uh, per vulnerability index. So this is very useful to export and to uh, include in other uh, statistical software or in your GIS uh, system. Sorry, I have no problem. 
So we saw the different uh, steps and uh, how the tool calculated the vulnerability index. And so as it was already uh, presented, the next step will be the stakeholder meeting, where really the aim of uh, this um, of uh, this uh, meeting will be to validate a vulnerability index threshold to consider a unit as a PAMI or not as a PAMI. It's a, a workshop, and I'm sure that you are used to, to do different workshops. So what we recommend to prepare this stakeholder meeting is to have a presentation to uh, share the methodology and the process uh, of the PAMI identification, to have also different maps where you can present the different results, the different vulnerability factors, or also the index, vulnerability index, and to have some people that are already identified to take notes also to take the final decision if there are uh, discussions. So as we said, the vulnerability index threshold will in fact uh, define if a unit will be considered as a PAMI or not. In the table that I show you on uh, with the tool, in fact, you, you will uh, see, uh, so you can see which threshold may be the best for your country. For example, here, we, if we choose a threshold at six, all the, the units that have a vulnerability index at six and above will be considered as a PAMI. So in our example, it will be 24 units it will represent 20, 27, sorry, 30% of the population. Sorry, there is a small error. 20 uh, units are automatically classified as PAMI because as they got uh, cholera cases uh, during the analysis period. Sorry, this, uh, this, uh, there are some error in, on this slide. And um, seven, uh, in fact, units will be considered uh, as a PAMI as they have an index value above the six. Sorry for the error on, on this slide. So the, as I said, it could be very, it's very useful to have maps to represent the, the different results. Here we can see the geographic di distribution of the initial PAMIs and of the vulnerability index. And as we said, it's really a balance between uh, the impact of your inter intervention and the feasibility of your intervention. For example, if we take again our, um, sorry. That's my problem. So if we take um, the example that I showed previously, sorry for this uh, technical problem. I have uh, just two small minutes. That's quite slow. Yeah. So if we take the previous example, we saw that, uh, for example, if we take a vulnerability index at six, so we have initial PAMI at 20, and uh, 20 units are included as the initial PAMI, and seven are included because they are above the vulnerability index threshold. 
if we take a vulnerability at the vulnerability index at four, the number of units increase a lot. They are at 39, and the population also increase a lot. So the impact will be uh, bigger, but also the feasibility to, uh, to implement the interventions in this number of units will be much higher. So it's really a balance between really what is feasible and which impact we would like to have, considering that it's really a prioritization process. You have to decide first where to intervene, and later, when you review your family or you know, your NCP, you can address uh, the cholera, uh, the cholera problem uh, with additional intervention in uh, other uh, units. It's really a prioritization and a balance between the feasibility and the uh, impact. So. Uh, here we can see this represented with uh, with maps, and we can see that really in the second option there are much more um, uh, units that are uh, uh, that are selected for NCP intervention. So as it was already said, uh, the final list of families uh, consists of the initial families with confirmed cholera uh, outbreaks uh, in the past five years, and the list of additional families uh, defined with the uh, vulnerability index threshold. Thanks a lot. And uh, don't hesitate, if you have uh, any question, I give you back uh, the floor. Okay. So now we will uh, thank a lot Dr. Anne for her presentation done jointly with Fred. I think we are at the end of the presentation and we will open the floor for live question. Uh, the question that were in the chat were responded already. So those that want to ask that question, you can raise your hand and uh, we will give you the floor. Let's start by Lawal Adam. Dr. Lawa, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. It seems that Lawal is having issues. Jacqueo, oh. man, can you unmute uh, Lawa? He, he wasn't muted. I think maybe he he, uh, he raised his hand by accident or something like that. Okay. So, dear colleague, please raise your hand to ask any question or to make a comment. Dr. Nye. You can have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me, colleagues? Yes. Okay. This is Mio Kamura from Nigeria Country Office. Um, I have a question. Uh, because the Nigerian government submitted the National Cholera uh, Plan uh, to Just City, and uh, we are expecting uh, some feedback. However, in that document, this PAMI concept, all these procedures are not reflected there. So how do we proceed here at the county level? Do we expect to receive some feedback or we can already start thinking of revising the document in the light of the new, uh, you know, the, the PAMI process? Thank you, Nova. Okay, let's hear from Abdul Majid and we will answer the two questions. 
Please, Ahmad. Dr. Abdul Majid didn't activate his microphone. He didn't connect with the microphone. Okay. So let's hear from Dr. Grace Saguti. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for the presentation. I would like to um, highlight the challenges we have in the country office on implementation of these national plans for control and uh, also in Zanzibar for elimination. The main issue is uh, government accepting and also uh, being engaged in these new processes. So what is the plan of uh, creating awareness first to the member states that are endemic of cholera to take up these new initiatives because we have a, a country multi-sectoral plan, but its implementation is also a challenge and it's ending in 2027. So bringing a new initiative of uh, identifying the priority areas, it needs a lot of awareness at the country level. So what is the plan in the regional office to raise this awareness? before we take up these uh, new initiatives. Thank you, over to you. Okay, many thanks, Dr. Grace. I will give the floor to the panelists to answer the two questions. The first one is from Nigeria and the second from Tanzania. Who is taking the first question? I propose that Morgan takes the first question because it is addressed to GTFCC. Who, um, I'll handle the question from Dr. Saguti. Sure, happy to take the first question from, uh, from Nigeria. So the PAMI methods that we are presenting today, they were published in 2023. And before that, there was uh, another GTFCC method. The last PAMI identification, I, I, when we say PAMI or hotspot, we are talking about the same thing. The last PAMI identification in Nigeria was done in 2021 using, of course, the previous method because the new one that we have been presenting through these webinars were, was not yet published. We've seen that the identification of PAMIs is closely related to NCP development and NCP implementation, which means that the identification of PAMIs has to be repeated periodically. Our recommendation is that they should be, PAMI identification should be updated at least every five years. So Nigeria having had its last PAMI identification in 2021 using the previous method is fine. But Nigeria should soon consider an update of its PAMI identification because uh, the clock for a five year period is ticking. And based on the information available at my level, actually, Nigeria is, if the process is not started, it will be very, very soon. Nigeria is one of the countries which is supported by the country support platform. And based on information provided by um, my CSP colleagues, uh, I think that Nigeria, if not already engaged in, a, in an update of PAMIs using the new method, will very soon do it. But to be clear, regarding the review of the NCP, which is being undertaken at the moment by the GTFCC IRP, don't worry, this should not prevent uh, endorsement by the GTFCC. Also, of course, you may find in the, the NCP review report some recommendation and advice to update the list of PAMI, which again will not be an issue for Nigeria because it's already being considered by, by the country. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Fred. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so before I actually uh, answer Dr. Grace, let me just also add um, to what Morgan has said. So, uh, one one of the things that we need to consider when we are looking at updating the PAM is, um, yeah, we may have used the old method, which is very okay, like Morgan has said, and develop the plan. 
but also now that we are seeing uh, the epidemiology of cholera changing a bit, you may discover that the initial uh, uh, hotspots that you identified, now the outbreak that we are seeing is going beyond that. So there are newer areas. So we are also encouraging that if you see that there is a significant change uh, in the epidemiology of cholera in the country with more new areas coming on board, it would be nice that you consider uh, updating the, the, the hotspots or the PAMIs now using the new method. Also added to that is that uh, even countries such as Tanzania, uh, Zimbabwe that have developed NC, uh, NCPs for control already, uh, what we are saying now, especially if there is a significant change in the epidemiology, you can still do the PAMIs and then update the plan. And in fact, countries such as Tanzania, you are supposed to also do a midterm review of the NCP. And at the point of doing a midterm review, then you can update the plan and include the new PAMIs. It's very, very important. Now, regarding the question on awareness, you are very right. And what we uh, agreed, and Dr. Vincent is here and Dr. Miriam, is that we felt that if we can first of all begin by uh, orienting or bringing awareness to the technical level, and then we can move upwards to the police level so that they are aware. We have seen positive um, indications from a number of countries. Examples is South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe joining now, and Malawi. Uh, they've moved in very well with the police level and agreed to move in the direction of the PAMIs. And so we are in the process of supporting these countries. So what we are saying is even at the regional level, I think the next step we are going to do is now engaging the police level and bringing, um, you know, uh, 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 orienting them on these new methods so that we can have that support. But we can even start from the country office. We can start some uh, engagements, uh, but even at the regional level, we are doing that. Maybe Dr. Vincent may want to add, and also Morgan, these are some of the things that we have discussed. Thank you. Dr. Vincent, you are muted. Yes, many thanks. Dr. Ann, do you want to add? Or uh, Dr. Minguez? Uh, thank you so much. No, I think, you know, this webinar it has been a timely because as I mentioned, you know, the government submitted the document. This is the first national cholera uh, control plan because previously was like acute diarrhea. This is much focused on uh, for cholera now. And uh, this was submitted uh, at the end of May, which is very recent from, you know, government to uh, GTFCC. And they are expecting some feedback from the group. So um, if uh, we may, you know, just uh, slow down this process of review and then from our side, we can review the document considering, uh, uh, you know, the the the, um, the new PAMI framework to review also uh, the hotspot, because as mentioned, uh, the, the last hotspot exercise was in 2021. Government, government requested WHO support to, uh, to do the next mapping. However, as you know, uh, we are having a, a, a big outbreak now in Lagos. And uh, uh, of course, the outbreak uh, uh, dynamic changes in country. So this may be an awesome opportunity instead of just going, uh, uh, finalizing the process of the current document, we may uh, take the opportunity to review and then update this part to have, you know, uh, the document more aligned to current <clears throat> Um, a, a dynamic of the, the the outbreak also considering you know all these the nomenclature and all the the uh, aspect uh, that has been now discussed in terms of uh, me how we are going to structure uh, for the the following years I think it's a good opportunity now instead of having just finalizing what was proposed just to take a step back to review. Um, the document, so I can go back to to the to the the, the country counterparts and then discuss this. It's just uh, uh, how is a guidance from your part how I I could proceed from my end. Thank you so much. No, I, I would like to 
to make few comments at this site for Nigeria. Uh, as you may see during the two webinars that we are concluding on for Anglophone countries, we had the webinar on cholera control, and today we discuss webinar on elimination control. In fact, the method for the control that apply for country like Nigeria, where cholera burden is high, is the method for control that we presented two weeks ago. And this method was the one used during the uh, analysis of passport in Nigeria mm -hmm. in 2021. It was the method that we were using for countries. Mm -hmm. Now we add the elimination because this method doesn't apply for some countries where the, the, the epidemiological profile of cholera is different. So regarding Nigeria, I think that if it is about the method used, there is no change. Now the issue can be, how are we implementing the NCP? This is the question and how fast you can receive feedback from the independent review panel to move forward. But as raised by Morgan, Nigeria is being supported by the country support platform led by IFRC and we work closely with them. So I think we will see with them the, how we can uh, discuss and uh, how we can speed up some aspects on the implementation of what was developed as cholera plan in Nigeria. This is what I want to add. The method we presented today does not apply for Nigeria. Okay. Let me give the floor to Sebastian. Vincent, I'm sorry, I was trying to raise my hand, but I didn't manage. <laughs> sorry about that. Just to complement, I think that the way forward that was proposed by Nigeria, which was not waiting to receive some feedback from the GTHC regarding a future update of the uh, PAMIS and be a bit more proactive to me, that sounds great. May I ask the colleague from Nigeria to send me uh, her contact detail in the chat? And if you don't want to share with everyone in the chat, you can select who you are sending it to. So I'm Morgan Dominguez. And then with your email, I will put you in contact with the secretariat of the panel who is reviewing the NCP so that proactively, without waiting for the feedback, you can already define the, the best strategy for Nigeria. Thanks. OK, many thanks. Uh, let's give the floor to Edwin. He's short too. All right, good morning, colleagues, and thank you, uh, Morgan and Fred, for the presentation and clarification provided on question asked by Dr. Mayer. Uh, mine is just to find out um, on the data. I, I say one of the in one of the critical steps, uh, we've been advised to use the GMP data on wash um, for the aspects that look at the vulnerability. But I'm also asking in the in the event of um, analysis, can we also use um, the wash norm report because Nigeria have a national wash survey that is quite very comprehensive and looks at what happens across level of care, more detailed looking into all the 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 issues of wash in community health facilities and other settings. So I'm just asking um in in the absence of uh, GMP, can that data be used or um, is a most that we must use the GMP data? Thank you. Okay, let's listen from Sebastian and then we will reply to your question. Uh, well, good uh, morning, all. I, I hope you are hearing me. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I am uh, Sebastian uh, Yenan, a director and a technical lead for cholera in Nigeria uh, since 2018. Uh, so I want to react to Dr. Mayer and also the response from the panelists. Uh, Nigeria was privileged to experiment with the GTFCC tool since uh, June 2018, where we had a consultant from the GTFCC to support the first hotspot mapping in June 2018. That document supported us uh, to access the OCV stockpile 
from the global stocks file. So since then, we have been able to do a series of uh, OCV campaigns using uh, the NCP that was submitted following that hotspot mapping in June 2018. Now, we had another major outbreak in 2021. The same GTFCC with the country support platform that Nigeria is also a beneficiary supported the development of another hotspot mapping in June 2021. Now, the last hotspot mapping we submitted and we are currently using is in September 2021. Now, all these hotspot mapping use the GTFCC tools, and this supported us to continuously access the global stock file for the campaigns we have been using. Now, we recently submitted our NCP. Our NCP is for control, not for elimination, knowing that we are a high burden cholera country. I'm happy with the response of uh, the panelists. Let us subject this NCP to review. It's presently with the IRP uh, under the GTFCC. If they have any recommendation that they want to provide to Nigeria, knowing that Nigeria has experimented with the previous tools since 2018, we will be happy to make those changes instead of stopping the review. Thank you. OK, many thanks, uh, Dr. Sebastian, for, for your input. Now let's give the floor to the panelists to respond to the first uh, question. And uh, if there is any comment on the uh, input of Sebastian. Okay, so let me let me let me start from my colleagues who add. So first and foremost, so Nigeria, the question is on the wash data from uh, GMP. The first thing that we need to understand for Nigeria, like Dr. Vincent has said and, uh, and Sebastian, is that for Nigeria, it's control. It's uh, identifying permits for control. So the method is slightly different. So there we concentrate on the AP indicators. So we look at the incidence, resistance, mortality, and test positivity. If all the data, the data, the four data indicators are there. Now, the issue of WASH uh, in the control is optional. That's the first thing that we need to uh, look at. The issue of vulnerability indicators in the control method is an op it's optional. The major indicators are AP indicators, which are four. So um, for me, you can bring in WASH, especially during validation, to try and identify or rather justify the inclusion of additional uh, PAMIs. Uh, but you need to look at the most recent data on WASH, which is accurate. And if it's also national level data, like from the Ministry responsible for water and sanitation, it may not be GMP as it were, but it can also be data that you have collected in the nation, you can include that. But the emphasis is that we are looking at the AP indicators. That is actually what I wanted to say. So our aim should be to look at AP indicators. Like Dr. Vincent, Vincent has said, this presentation is on elimination. So for countries that are in elimination, giving examples, uh, countries such as Botswana, Namibia, uh, South Africa, those are in elimination. So those who use this method. But for countries that have high burden like Nigeria, it's control. Now, added to that, uh, Sebastian brought out an important. We don't need to uh, uh, begin to redo what Nigeria has already done because uh, you identified the hotspots in 2021. Now, there's just a small, there's a slight difference, uh, Sebastian, between the new method and the previous method. The previous method we were using the GTFCC method, the two, which was actually looking at two indicators. That is the mean annual incidence and persistence. But the beauty about this new one is that we have improved it to include more indicators. 
Uh, and if you remember very well, I think there were a lot of questions about the old GTFCC2, especially how we could actually incorporate the other indicators. But the beauty is the new one has done that. So for Nigeria, there is no need unless there is significant changes in the epidemiology of cholera, where there are so many other areas that are now seemingly hotspots, and you may need to include them in the NCP for the purpose of targeting them for interventions. But as it is, maybe we can allow the GTFCCI RRP to go ahead, and then when they give us their feedback, at that point, we can make decisions of how we can move forward. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Dr. Fred, for this input. I will uh, concur with Fred that Nigeria and uh, with Sebastian, that Nigeria should move ahead with the process of review of the NCP and for the implementation. And uh, as raised by Morgan, Re a review when the hotspot of PAMI analysis and NCP development are two uh, twin process. And I think when the country will uh, uh, decide to update the NCP, they will start by reviewing the hotspot analysis. And uh, this should start from 2026 if the country want to consider the five years in the for the revision of uh, the hotspots. Let's give the floor to Yetunde for a few minutes because we need to conclude this uh, uh, webinar. Mr. Abioye. All right, um, good day, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to actually um, speak so i think i don't know if this has been asked but um, i think it would just be good to also see the progress uh with the former two and then um i'm actually from nigeria just trying to see if it's possible to still do this again using this um upgraded tool and then see the difference um across board from the uh, previous version we had in 2018 and then currently and then i don't know if this has also been asked is it possible to also use this approach uh, for other diseases as well. So thank you, Anova. Okay, many thanks for your question, Morgan or Fred. Uh, Morgan, you can go ahead. Thank you. So the first question regarding whether there would be some value in comparing the outcome of uh, the previous uh, GTFCC method and the new one. Um, it might be relevant, but uh, uh, my take from the previous discussion about uh, Nigeria, the previous question from Nigeria and answer from uh, Fred and Vincent, is that um, for now, uh, the NCP review will keep going and there might be some uh, offline follow-up uh, to decide on the best course of action. And your other question was about whether this method could be used for other diseases than cholera. In terms of the general principle, which is using the data for evidence-based uh, decision-making to prioritize geographic area and to develop effective and impactful and targeted control and prevention strategy, the principle would apply. But then depending on the disease considered, you may, of course, have to adapt uh, the criteria and the factors that would be taken into account to the disease that is being considered. But as a general principle, relying on data and evidence for, for uh, the decision-making process, yes, of course, uh, it would be advisable to follow something similar for other diseases. But again, the, the, to, the tool and, and the, the method as such would need to be customized to the disease considered. Thanks. Okay, many thanks to Morgan for this feedback on the question and many thanks to all the colleagues online for participating to this webinar. We will now give the floor to Dr. Miriam for the closing remark for this webinar. Dr. Miriam. Okay, thank you very much, Vincent. Sorry, I cannot put my camera now because the internet is quite weak. 
Uh, thank you so much, colleagues, for this very informative webinar. I see that there are still many questions coming up, but uh, I think that you could uh, send even email to these uh, colleagues for further questions and further clarifications. But we want to thank you, the, the presenters, Morgan, Anna, Kapaya, Fred, and Masina for this uh, very informative webinar. As you have heard, uh, the identification of PAMIS is a critical element when we are looking at cholera control or cholera elimination. In this webinar, we focused on how to identify them for cholera elimination. We have also identified uh, or given an indication on which countries should consider elimination versus which countries should consider control. And they have uh, the presenters have articulated very well that it is a progressive uh, process. You start with control, and when you have reached a control level, then you can move to elimination. So we should not feel like, oh, I am put, um, focusing on control, country X is focusing on elimination. It is a process, and if we work hard, the, the end target for all of us, all of, all of the countries, is elimination of cholera, and it is achievable if we put ourselves to it. The other important issue that has been highlighted here is the involvement of the different stakeholders in the identification of PAMIS. So the, the different sectors that are involved, the WASH, the, uh, the communications, all the other sectors that are involved Really, it is uh, very good to include them right from the beginning to discuss the factors and then also to review the data. Having data is a key component of this. So we need to identify data sources for the different factors, the population data, the, 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 the health data, the wash data. And uh, we try our level best to find the, the different sources. In some countries, this might be a little harder than in others, but it's important that we all try to, to, to work on this. Uh, with that, I want to, to say again, thank you to the participants for listening in attentively. I hope that each one of us has gone away with a, a new information, new determination, to, to do more work on cholera towards elimination of this disease in our region. I want to thank you all. And uh, with this, I request that we, we close the, the webinar with special thanks to our facilitators for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear colleague. And uh, let's move now for the implementation of what we have here. here. Goodbye, have a good day. And let's meet in one week for those who speak French for the, the session in French. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>